We're on the corner of Grand and Mott in Little Italy, you know, downtown Manhattan here, or what's left of Little Italy. You know, we did a show here a couple of seasons ago, and the truth of the matter is this neighborhood's become very, very Chinese. It's more or less Chinatown North. But there are some stalwarts, some holdouts, some great stories. Last time I was here, we did Ferrara, some restaurants. Ferrara's right down the block. They're going to be here forever. We love them. We're outside of De Paolo's, which is really the most iconic cheese store in New York City. Nobody would dispute that the best source, the best single source for Italian cheeses is De Paolo's. Let's go inside. We're going to talk cheese, specifically with Lou, and get a show out of this with Lou De Paolo here and then Frankie De Carlo at Baccaro later on. This is a central point for the foods of Italy. Today we represent all 20 regions of Italy, from the finest cheeses, olive oils, and salumi. And if you think Italian, you remember Di Paolo. And we're very fortunate that people still make a pilgrimage to visit us. You know, they might have been customers uh, in, from uh, years back living in this community. As they moved away, they still come back. And we've been discovered by many people that are just that have traveled to Italy and have looked for the finest Italian products. We have in this small shop over 300 varieties of cheeses of Italy. We have over 100 varieties of Pecorino, cheeses made out of sheep's milk, which has a long history in Italy, going back to the Romans. But we also travel up into the mountains of Trentino and uh, the Veneto and seek out these ancient cheeses, uh, cheeses uh, such as Grana Padano, which has a history of a thousand years, Asiago, from, from the air, Asiago, Piano de Asiago, the plateau of Asiago, which is rich, fertile grasslands where cows free graze. The cheese is so rich and buttery and sweet that, you know, you, you are tasting the environment. Besides being one of the greatest sources for Italian ingredients in the country, for the retail trade, De Paolo's store is really frequented by chefs all the time. He's a hero to many of them. He was the first guy to bring in the spec. And guys like Frankie DiCarlo come in here almost every day. Frankie lives just a block away and walks past the store every day on the way to his restaurant, Pheasant, to check out what's new and, of course, to pick up some great cheese from the Veneto region and some spec. You need some spec alto adage, you said? Yes, yes. Okay. All right, I'm going to give you a whole one. They're running beautiful, though. I just okay. wanted to show you how nice they're running over there on it. I mean, that's so beautiful. It's like, let me, let me, take really, it out of the and you want to know, you really have to taste this. I'm going to have my brother Sal slice a few slices for us to taste right now. Here, try this. I know, this is, <laughs> this is beautiful. It, it's a little, this, this particular product is a little bit leaner than your prosciutto di Parma or San Daniele. Because uh, it is kind of trimmed and they use a little slightly younger hog because they only cure it for about five and a half, mo five and a half months. This is the uh, Asiago Fresco or Presato. What happens with this cheese, as it's fresh like this, you have little pinholes. As it ages, you know, after 40 or 45 days, these holes start to swell up and the cheese gets a little bit sharp in taste. See here? Now the alevo, if you notice, you'll have little larger holes here. That's from the cheese actually raising up a little bit. And this is the vecchio, which is aged for one year. And you'll notice this is a little bit drier, sharper. smell this on TV, but the smell of these stores from the provolone cheese, from the aged meats, from the salumi, the tanging, you just can't replicate this. It's great. And then you come here for these great, great Italian ingredients. You know, if you're looking for a sotto, you're looking for Italian rices, half a shelf down here of just some of the most beautiful risotto. And these are, again, from the Veneto region. This is as you drive out of Venice and you're going uh, west. This is what you'll see is these fields of rice that produce this. These beautiful honeys that are coming from single flowers, acacia honey. I love anchovies, and these are beautiful. Agostino Reccio, great Italian producer. Beautiful, beautiful anchovies. You know, Italians love them. This is a big pack. Even though we're, we're in Italy and it's so ethnically diverse, you can see they've got Asian clientele, 
I don't know what they're buying here. You know, maybe the uh, Chinese immigrants around here now have a taste for, for prosciutto, for uh, fresh mozzarella. But, you know, I'm in here today, and there's an Asian fellow here behind the, that's tasting and buying. You know, we're here in line. Look at these two young guys. You know, a lot of the customers here, older but mixed ethnicities. I'd say, who are these guys? So tell me, what, what's your story? What are you doing at the Paolo? Well, I'm buying cheeses now with my friend. This is the first time he's here. I've been coming here a couple of times, a couple of years now. And uh, I have a cooking show, Cooking with Will. <laughs> and uh, we came here for one show and with Lou, and we shot a bunch of cheeses and made an episode. So you're like my competition or something like that? Yeah. Hey, you know what I mean? We're going to have to edit this out. Where's your cooking show? Well, it's, uh, we have a website right now, cookingwithwill.com. And uh, we're redoing it. We have new shows coming out. And also, um, I have a summer house on Shelter Island. And we run it out there. Nice. That's great. That's cool. So a young guy like you and you're into food, so you're the new generation of foodies. That's what we need. You tell your friends. What's your name again, Mike? Um, I'm Mike Belvedere. I live in uh, Merrick, New York, and I'm just here to buy some cheese. Well, you guys, have, you came to the right place. If you had to come to oh, New York yeah, to yeah. buy cheese, it's the, best. It's the only. This is the number one Italian cheese store in the city, if not the country. Good luck with your show, man. Maybe you'll all see right, you on thanks. the TV Food Network. Don't forget me when you're famous, all right? Let me the history of this store, because you guys, to me, you're like one of the last, I mean, you and Ferrara and a couple of the last of the Mohicans down here and what's left. So, you know, my, first, my family first emigrated from a small area, small region of Italy, Pasolicata, in 1903. My great-grandfather, Savino Di Paolo, he was the patriarch, came here, before, left his family behind, and settled here on Mott Street. In 1910, he opened up a simple latteria. A latteria is a dairy, you know, where we make fresh mozzarella and ricotta. And in 1914, he called his family in. And since then, we've been in the dairy business. And now I'm the fourth generation, along with my brother Sal and my sister Marie. And we're proud to maintain that same tradition of the Italian immigrants. Over the years, Mott Street has been assimilated into most of Chinatown, but for me, this is always Little Italy. This is my home. This is where we, we had our shop. Mike, this is truly one of the old tenements of New York City. This building was probably built around 1875, 1880. This block here was a block where no English was spoken, only Italian or Yiddish. Two different ethnic cultures lived together. and. This building didn't even have a bathroom in the apartment. My mother and her family shared the bathroom with her neighbor, who happened to be the rabbi of this very precious, special synagogue, one of the oldest synagogues here in, in New York City. And uh, it's precious to see that even today, still, no English is spoken on this block. <laughs> yeah, right. But it's the new wave of immigrants that are here for the same wants and desires that our parents and grandparents came here for, to it's make a, a better country. life. You know, it's great to see these generational businesses surviving. It's one of the hardest things to do in a business. I love to cover these stories, places like Russ and Daughters in the city, and the DePaolo cheese shop is like that. It's a shrine to Italian ingredients. And for years, it was just a little tiny store. Well, now that Lou's son's coming in the business, Lou's expanding, the square footage is going to be almost three times the size. And of course, they're moving onto the World Wide Web because that's the generation that Lou's boy comes from. He spent some time in Italy with the slow food movement. He goes back and forth a lot, speaks the language, really gets the food, and now, besides shopping at Lou's store in New York City, you can get to Paolo's great products by visiting the web. What we want to do is supply the same experience, so offer the same experience you would get by coming into our family store over the internet. Getting to know the product, a little bit of where it comes from, how to enjoy it. And uh, you also find video clips of our selecting happening in Italy that we do periodically throughout the year. Uh, it should be, it seems very exciting. And Give us the website so I don't mess it up. Uh, it's www.dipaloselects.com. It's going to be as much educational as an online store. And that's where we're really very proud of it because we want to bring all the knowledge. And if you want to learn where the product is produced, meet the producers, see our relationship with these people. Uh, this, is, this is the whole key to, I think, what our website is about. Not only an online store, but also a source of information uh, and knowledge on the foods of Italy. So we're here on Division Street. You know, I don't know, grab a map. It's out the canal, 
west of this, east of Allen. I don't know. It's downtown. It's where the 3rd Avenue L used to start. It's a one-way street, kind of in the middle of nowhere, downtown Manhattan. I love this place. We're going to get the story of how Baccaro came to be. Frankie and his wife Dulcie's vision of a Venetian wine bar transported to lower Manhattan. This place is a jewel. Enough stand-up. Let's get inside. Frank, DiCarlo, love your guys. You know, I'm a huge fan of Peasant, and I really felt awful with Peasant. I mean, you're, you're at Peasant as many nights a week as Frank is, running the front of the house, putting up with all the knuckleheads in the dining room, <laughs> a.k.a. the New York diners, and I'm the chef, so what do I do? I'm interviewing chefs all the time, so tell me the idea for Baccaro, your second restaurant together, the collaboration as a, right. as a couple. Where'd the idea come from, from you, in your words? In my words, um, it was our love for Venice. I mean, we love Italy, but in particular, Venice what is a very special place for Dulce and myself. Um, it's, it's such a magical little city, you know. It's, it's like no other place on the earth. And we both appreciate it so much for its architecture, its history, its so on and so forth. But basically, it's, it's really a personal thing. It's both of our, the love we share for that city in particular. So you have Peasant, it's up and running, and Dulce, you're thinking, let's, let's, let's do one more space. And so that, this, this location, this street, and the concept, too, of sort of a different style of food, maybe not the Peasant's formal, but a different price point. Talk to me, because you made some great points yeah, earlier off camera. absolutely, absolutely. Um, when we went to Venice, the whole thing about it was that it's, this great city, it has wonderful facades, it's very fanciful, it's very, um, you know, a lot of people go there but they don't really see the innards of it and uh, we loved the idea of taking something from there, a little magical place, putting it here, transplanting it in New York City so people can get a real feel of what the working class are doing there, what the locals really are experiencing. And so we wanted to, um, you know, have people come and be social, have food and wine, um, be able to have small bites, big bites, like a full eight course dinner or just, a, you know, a little snack and uh, just basically have a good time. And I feel like when people come to Peasant, they feel very formal, you know, all the open fires and, you know, it has more of that Tuscan feel and we wanted something a little more casual, a little more fun, um, you know, maybe a little bit of a younger crowd too, because this area of the Lower East Side is right. all about the young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's so many galleries around, there's a lot happening, there's a lot of excitement and energy. So, um, you know, we, traveled around New York trying to find something that reminded us of Venice and Division Street here is a perfect location because it's windy like the Cali's of Venice. You get lost, you can't find it yourself, you need a map. Me. In <laughs> Venice, you need a map no matter where you go. Even the locals need a map sometimes, they get lost. Um, so this quiet little street over here was just, you know, it was just uh, very darling to us and we just thought, let's do something here, let's, you know, make this happen, let's make New Yorkers feel like they literally have been transported without the airfare and going through customs and all of that. This is a classic artichoke. The stuffing is the stem of the artichoke, a little garlic, breadcrumb, and grana padano. You have the baby octopus, you have the sepia, you have calamari, you have zucchini. Razor clam out of the shell. Razor, yes, razor, razor clam, exactly. My influence was just trying to be as authentic as, as possible. They're not, these recipes are not my variation or a spin on classic recipes. These are straightforward, you know, historic Venetian recipes. And uh, that, was, that was the point. This is the, uh, the octopus salad. This is a very s simple, of course. It's uh, celery, potatoes, uh, Italian, parsley, olive oil, and baby octopus. Anyone who watches the show, we, a couple of years ago we did Peasant, listen to me on the radio, talk a lot about this guy, Frankie DiCarlo. Thanks for having us in your kitchen. My pleasure. One of my favorite chefs in the city. You know why? Well, A, he's great, that's A. B, loves to cook, uh, is on the stove all the time at Peasant, has a great guy here, Sexto, that's his right-hand man, there's a lot of the food here, but Frankie's gonna do a couple of demos for us 
that are going to feature some of the ingredients we've seen. Talk about this cuisine that you loved so much when, when you and Dulce would go to Venice and oh, yeah. go to these wine bars and come back because it is so unique. You know, it's this that part of Italy that is so much of Italian cuisine is that. It's so oh. linked to the place. So you've got the ocean around Venice and you've got right. the risotto growing. In the Veneto, just as you head west, you see those fields, and, and then the cheeses, and the corn, and, fields, and, the, and, the, and, the corn and the polenta, and if you travel to that part of Italy, you see that, and that's always in Italian food what informs it. Tell me what you have in mind today for the demos. Well, being that we're, we're Baccaro, and being that we're product from the Veneto, I'm going to make a risotto with uh, spac, asiago, and white asparagus. Mm. Mm. Traditional. Yep. We're going to start this risotto with shallots and a little bit of olive oil. A little olive oil from Lake Garda, Veneto. <laughs> the beauty of this place is all our products are from here. The speck, a little bit of the speck goes in the pan, just cut real thin. Yes. These shallots, they're just barely golden. I don't, I don't want them past barely golden because I don't want them really conflicting with the white asparagus. Yeah, the, and the dish is going to be almost white on white. It is, yeah. except for the spec, it's pretty much, it's, it's white on white because I'm not adding any herbs to this at all. Okay, the white asparagus. And that asparagus from Blanche? Another all? product of the Veneto. The risotto. This no. is Violone Nano risotto okay. from the Veneto. So what's the name again? Violone Nano. That's the brand. It's just in beautiful. That's a, right. Right. Just one of the varieties of that short grain that grows in that region. Right. So a little splash of wine. What did you choose there, Frankie? Oh, this is this is uh, this is a. Pinot Bianco from the Veneto. This one, actually. This is uh, Salvalai. And this is, this is a beautiful Pinot Bianco from this region. I use it to cook with because it's just great. But that's, a, that's a, a perfect drinking wine as well. In fact, lots of restaurants use this. We'll pour this by the glass. The, the stock I'm using for this is just the stock from the white asparagus. So as I make this risotto, Sixto is going to make the uh, bacala with polenta, which is another traditional dish of Venice. And this is Sixto Coronel, the chef of Baccaro, who's been with me for, what, 12 years, 13, whatever. It's been a long time. So you adopted him when he was three? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Just some chopped garlic, rough chopped pan, olive oil. Now, th this is the cod. This is salted cod. Rehydrated. That's been rehydrated for three days in water, changing the water. And what we do is bring it slowly to a boil with milk, OK? This is, only takes about 10 minutes. Bring it up to a boil, and then turn it off and let it sit for a while. So now it gets rehydrated first by water and then by milk, which keeps it creamy, yeah, yeah. gives it creamy consistency, and actually comes back out at a later point. So garlic, little olive oil, garlic is golden brown, in goes the cod. <laughs> yeah, back to the uh, risotto. About halfway done, maybe a little past. Yeah. I just added a little more white asparagus stock to this. And you'll just keep adding as it reduces. It picks it up, kind of dries out a little, and then yeah. no stock. A couple of ounces at a time. All right, Sixto, back to you, baby. You good over there, Sixto? A little bit of salt. Little heavy creams coming in the picture. This is actually a very quick process at this point, at this stage. So these are very simple, pretty simplistic 
but that's recipes Ita here. But that's which, Italian which are, cooking. Great ingredients. That's it. Don't get in the way. Uh, Sixo just added uh, uh, fresh cut Italian parsley to this, and it's done. This, this cod is done. We serve this over a traditional polenta, a white polenta from the Veneto. Aha. Now, white polenta from white corn. Yes. It doesn't get much more simple, doesn't get much more basic, it doesn't get much more rustic, right? Simple, almost peasant food, Frankie. You know, I had this dish the first time I was here, big tasty menu, we had most of the menu, and I just remember thinking, God, this is so simple and so good. Corn's really creamy, really fluffy. That's when you cook polenta nice and slowly. Cod's beautiful. I mean, this is like white food, but delicious tasting white food. Mm. It's hard to describe, you know, these kind of flavors, but again, corn's beautifully creamy, picks up the flavor from the cod. Cod's got olive oil and a little bit of heavy cream. This is maybe one of my favorite dishes with salt cod. You know, bacalao. A brandade in French. All these cultures had this idea way before refrigeration of salting and preserving cod and doing things with it. Lots of them I've never really, even though I'm Italian, acquired a taste for. This one I love. I don't know what it is that Frankie does about this, but this is a great dish. One more bite and I'm going to have to see the risotto so I don't lose the last minute of that. But wonderful. Hop on. Hop on in, baby. Okay, so now this is at, this is at the right consistency. The risotto's cooked in, it's uh, still al dente, and at this point, I'm going to add the Asiago cheese. Nice big handful of grated Asiago. And this is the young Asiago, which, which will melt right into this risotto. The prosciutto. This, and I also, believe, is three, three months. Yep. This young. And it adds a lot of creaminess to oh, it, too. Oh, yeah, completely. Oh, look how, look at the... Look how creamy this becomes now. Oh, this is just beautiful. Oh, you can smell that from here. Oh, I can still so smell gorgeous. the wine. You can smell this mixture of the wine, which is actually still present in there. That perfume, the speck, a little bit of smokiness. Oh, yeah. Um, of course, the cheese. This is a great plate of food. Just, I like to... I like to Mix that fresh pepper in there, give a little heat on that. You get those of those esters and the from the when there's that fresh crack. It's, it's beautiful, Frank. Thank you. You know, on the nose you've got the you've got you've got the white asparagus, which as you said, yeah, it's kind of bland, but you can, it has a distinct perfume. It to does. It. White asparagus, a little smoke from the speck, a little ham. I can still feel that wine, even though it's been cooked out for 16 minutes. It will. It's still right. there. The flavor is still in there. Yeah, of that grape. Gorgeous. Creamy. Oh, and just. The, the Venetians like their risottos creamy, or, or, or rather a little wet rather than dry. Right, they, right. Typically. I, and I prefer that too. I don't know. Yeah. So every, every so often, if I've made a mistake or doing too many things at once and my risotto is perfect, the truth is you let it go two more minutes and the starch yeah. can't stop oh, itself. It, it, it just sucks it up and then you end up with this kind of cakey. I've never liked that. Right. I and mean, I like creamy too. And, and the risotto, it's al dente quality. It's just perfect. Oh, it's yeah. cooked through. It's not raw. No, it no. just gives you a little bit of a bite at the end. Beautiful plate of food. What's plans for the future for you guys? I don't know how you juggle all the balls in the air that you have going, but uh, is this going to be it? Is there another concept in mind? What's happening with the... Yeah, there's uh, definitely another concept in mind. We're not going to talk about it. It's All right. Secret. Well, that gives me a chance <laughs> in another season or two to just follow you guys around with my PBS show. Absolutely, absolutely.